want to take you into the future of energy and transportation. And when I say future, I don't mean 50 years from now. I mean five years, 15 years from now. Um, but before I do that, I want to take you into the past. Um, this is New York City, 1900, Easter Parade. Um, we used horses for thousands of years as our main means of transportation, we human beings. Um, there is one car in this picture. Can anyone see the one car in that picture? Okay, I don't have all night there. <laughs> Um, there is one car in New York City, Easter Parade, 1900. 13 years later, can anyone see the horse <laughs> in that picture? 13 years later, New York City went from all horse, minus one, to all cars. That horse doesn't even look like a horse. This is called a disruption, uh, a technology disruption, and that's my work. Um, let me take you to 1985 when, um, yeah, exactly, uh, <laughs> when the then largest uh, telecom company on earth, uh, Monopoly, uh, AT&T, had this thing called the cell phone, and they hired uh, McKinsey and Company to essentially do a forecast what's going to be the adoption of this thing called the cell phone in 15 years? So by the year 2000, how many subscribers will we have in the United States? So McKinsey went off and did whatever it is that they do and charged five million bucks for it. Um, and they came back and this was the answer. 900,000 by the year 2000. The actual number was 109 million. That's not a small mistake. Uh, that's a factor of 120 times, right? So when you see the uh, projections from the you know, International Energy Agency and so on and so forth, think about that, about what mainstream analysts are trying to sell you. Um, by being disrupted, AT&T not only, you know, it's landline business, went down, but also it missed out on some of the biggest legal um, market opportunities of the 21st century. If you just look at the top 15 listed companies, uh, internet and mobile, um, essentially that's $2.4 trillion in market valuation. And so by missing out on a disruption, your business goes away, but, but also you don't participate in the new opportunities uh, afforded by the new disruption. And it's usually the experts and the insiders, very smart people, usually, who dismiss disrupt the disruptive opportunities. You know, the, why would anyone, I mean, 10 years ago, why would anyone buy the iPhone, the $600 iPhone, when they could buy the $100 Nokia? Right? I mean, it didn't make sense. So, you know, these are very smart people. The internet, let's not make a big deal out of that. Um, so part of my work, and again, and again, and again. Should I even talk about Kodak? No? <laughs> the, I mean, some of you don't even know what that is, right? Uh, <laughs> the year 2000 was a record year in photography worldwide. Record. Record revenues, record profits, record number of print. Uh, photos, and 12 years later, they were bankrupt. 12 years later, and if anybody had stood up there in 2000 and said, there's this thing called the digital camera, which by the way, Kodak invented. Yeah, so it's not like they didn't know what was coming, <laughs> right? Um, so that's another disruption. So my work in many ways over the last decade or so has been to answer this question. Why do smart people in smart organizations uh, consistently fail to anticipate, let alone lead, market disruptions? Um, so I developed a framework to understand technology disruption, um, that there are many ways of disrupting. I could talk about this for an hour. I'll just walk you through a few things, and then I'll 
dive into energy and transportation. So one of the most important things to consider is um, technology cost curves. So if you look at Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is built on this, on Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says that uh, on a dollar basis, computing power has essentially doubled uh, every two years for decades. So it improves at about 41% rate per year with the same dollar. Right? So when you look at it over 20 years, essentially we can, uh, this $600 iPhone has the computing power of what a computer 20 years ago would have cost $600,000. And 40 years ago, that same computer would have cost $600 million. And 60 years ago, that same computer would have been $600 billion. So that's the power of technology cost curves, right? Ex especially, uh, when they improve exponentially. So in energy, we have several cost curves for technologies that essentially all of which um, will, as I'm gonna show you, enable disruptions of energy and transportation. One of them is lithium ion batteries, uh, which from about, uh, so I'll come back to this. The other one being solar photovoltaics, which have improved dramatically since at least 1970. Um, now, one important concept is that of technology convergence. So single technologies in and of themselves are not what cause disruptions. Essentially, when you have several technologies that converge, um, at basically, and can enable the, uh, on a cost basis, on a financially uh, viable basis, can enable certain functionalities that were not possible before. So for the smartphone, that year was 2007. That was the year when computing and digital imaging and touchscreen technology and lithium ion batteries and so on made it possible for someone to create a smartphone. It turned out to have been Google and uh, Apple who created the Android and the uh, iPhone, but it could have been somebody else. It could have been, oh, Nokia, for instance, Motorola, anybody, really. Um, and so the concept of technology convergence is very important. It's when several technologies and business model innovation converge at one point in time to enable certain uh, functionality at a certain cost. Um, the other important thing is the concept that technologies get adopted as an S-curve. So again, when you look at mainstream um, projections, say of EVs or solar and whatnot, you see a linear projection. No technology in history, successful technology in history, right, that I know of, has ever been adopted on a linear basis, ever. It gets adopted as an S-curve. Once you hit that tipping point, essentially, so this is the example of color TV. So essentially it can move sideways for a long time and then when it hits that tipping point, it disrupts the existing market and it gets adopted, it grows exponentially, super exponentially in weeks and months and a few years. And this is how disruptions happen because people look at it and they're like, ah, oh, it's only one, 2% of the market and then boom, it's 80% of the market in no time. And that's because of that technology convergence which made it possible for entrepreneurs to create new products and services. Now, the interesting thing about uh, S-curves is not only that they're exponential, but the, it's getting even steeper, meaning that disruptions are happening even more quickly. So if you look at the turn of the 1900s, the S-curves were long, so it would take years, decades for uh, products to get adopted by the market, and look at it now. It happens in years. I mean, in some cases, in months. So the, the, the exponential is actually getting even more exponential these days. And that's because of the internet, that's because we're a more global society and so on. Um, a huge thing in disruption is business model innovation. And business model innovation is every bit as disruptive as technology. Every bit. So um, Uber, a uh, little company called Uber, which did not even exist 
10 years ago. Uh, actually, they started 2009. Um, and today, their bookings are higher than the whole taxi industry in America. Okay? Eight years. Eight years. So whoever is going to tell you that disruptions in transportation cannot happen in 10 years, well, look at Uber. Look at what they've done uh, in less than 10 years. And they're just getting started. They're doubling every year. It's uh, unbelievable. Um, so they're a business model innovation that was enabled by two things, the cloud and smartphones. So essentially, they took advantage of that convergence and disintermediated this very inefficient uh, market, taxis. Same thing with Airbnb. That's a business model innovation. It's actually an old business model. They're broker. I mean, we've had brokers for hundreds of years, but not in this market. So that business model was enabled, again, by a convergence of technologies that made it possible for someone to do that. So business model is as disruptive as technology is. So I took this framework that I created, that you know, it included bits and pieces of a lot of thought leaders and so on. Um, and essentially, I wrote this book called Clean Disruption. Uh, and that was three years ago. And essentially, that's what I'm going to talk about today in follow-on work that I have done. What it says is that there are um, four technologies, five technologies, plus business model innovation that over the next 13 years or so are going to disrupt all of energy and transportation as we know it. And it's going to happen for purely economic reasons, uh, essentially. So let me walk you through some of these technologies, batteries. Uh, lithium ion batteries improved by about 14% per year from about 95 to about 2010. 14%, that's the cost curve. Um, and then two new industries came into, and that's what we used for cell phones and laptops and so on. Uh, and then two trillion dollar industries, auto and energy, came into lithium ion. And guess what happened next? It accelerated. So over the next few years, it accelerated to 16% from 2010 to about 2014. Um, and over the last, oh, six years, right now, to our knowledge, there are about 12 mega factories of lithium ion batteries. Huge, you know, we hear about the Tesla Gigafactory. Well, there are just about 12 going up around the world. Um, and this means what? More investments, more R&D, uh, more scale. And guess what happened? The cost curve for lithium ion since 2010 to 2016 was 20% per year. So it went down from about $1,000 to about $200. Insane, right? And it's still accelerating. So we may yet. Uh, uh, so I'm going to show you how that can be disruptive. So Dyson, right? Dyson makes vacuum cleaners, right? They bought a um, lithium ion company from Detroit, and they're going to invest a billion pounds in batteries. And they're getting into the electric vehicle market. What? Dyson? Dyson? <laughs> Hello, right? I mean, isn't the auto, isn't a car difficult to build? Talk about a clean disruption, right? Uh, Dyson, and sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you why Dyson um, and any high school kid actually can build an electric vehicle. I'll, I'll tell you that in a few minutes. But so batteries, just the cost curve going down, essentially you can map out over the next few years, assuming that it's going to continue at that rate, um, what markets it can disrupt. So it, again, the convergence for different markets happens at different times. Um, so storage, for instance, on a utility scale on the grid, the grid is essentially a just-in-time system. So every time we switch, you know, we flip a switch, you know, the utility generates more, and in the summer especially, um, you know, the, when we use air conditioning, and summer is pretty long here, right? There's a lot of sunshine. Um, essentially, um, it's a just-in-time system where we generate basically microseconds before or after the demand. Um, what that means is that 
it's a very inefficient industry. It's built for the peak. So if you look at Con Edison New York, just about a third of their generating assets uh, are used less than 6% of the year, 6%. So some of it is used a few hours every year. Um, that's a very expensive way to produce energy. Um, and you know, up to now, we then have storage to essentially compete with that peak, essentially when we needed uh, that summer peak. And you know, in my book, essentially, a 6% asset utilization is a disruption waiting to happen. And in fact, it is starting to happen, and even conventional energy CEOs are saying that by 2020, there may never be another peaker ever built in the US. Uh, peakers are usually natural gas and, and so on. But even now, I mean, this is not 2020. If you look at what happened in California last year, the huge natural gas leak and so on, the um, Public Utility Commission in California ordered Southern California Edison to put up batteries, essentially for the peak. And Tesla built it in 88 days, okay? 88 days, right? Try that with a nuclear power plant or with a coal power plant, 88 days. So the disruption of peakers has already started. Essentially, this is disrupting what otherwise would have been natural gas peakers in California. Now, it's not just at that level. Business model innovation, like I said, is uh, disruptive and there are companies who are providing storage as a service to companies. So companies, uh, for instance, in New York, Connecticut, demand charges, so on a per kilowatt, hour, per kilowatt basis, are up to 50% of the cost of energy. Not what you consume, but demand charges. So what these companies are doing is essentially saying, I'll put up a battery behind the meter, and essentially I will charge you if I save money. If you save money, I want 50%. Talk about a business model innovation, right? So essentially they're going to the 7-Elevens of the world and the hotels of the world and saying, I'll put this storage behind the meter um, so that we can store where, when energy is cheap, and then you can use it when, it, when it's expensive. Um, and they say that that lowers utility bills by 10 to 50%. Now, this is not efficiency. I mean, these companies are using the exact number of kilowatt hours, but they're using it in a different way. They're storing uh, some of it to use later. Um, so I've done some numbers um, on the cost curve of uh, batteries, and by 2020 or so, uh, it'll cost the average American consumer about a dollar a day, it's actually improving, um, to basically store 24 hours of electricity. A dollar a day, that's 30 bucks a month, right? Um, now, you don't need to store a whole day. You don't need to store 24 hours to disrupt the utility. All you need to store is four to six hours. That's it. Right? because that's the peak. That is the most profitable part of a lot of utilities, the peak, right? Um, so four hours essentially are gonna cost, oh, 20 cents a day. That's it, by 2020. Boom, disruption, okay? And people are gonna do it because it's gonna be in their best selfish economic interest. They're gonna put up storage because it's gonna save them money, okay? Um, and this is why you see whole islands going solar in months, because the cost of solar plus storage is already uh, cheaper than diesel generation, which is what powers most islands. Solar plus storage is already cheaper than, and that's why you see, uh, and you're gonna continue to see a lot of islands go 100%. We're not talking 2050, we're talking now, because it's already cheaper. Um, so batteries are becoming so cheap that essentially, because of economic reasons, everyone, houses, malls, parking spaces, buildings are gonna have storage. And they're gonna have storage because it makes sense, just like we have data storage. Imagine a computer without data storage. Well, energy storage is gonna be just like that, just like data storage is to computers, energy storage is gonna be to uh, housing. Now. 
what batteries are going to enable is another disruption, which is the electric vehicle disruption. So first, let's ask, is the electric vehicle disruptive? Yes, it's clean and all that, but is it disruptive? Um, so Tesla um, has been named the best car ever made. Best car, not best EV, best car ever made. And Consumer Reports gave them a rating of 103 <laughs> out of 100, right? <laughs> I'm not making it up. That's Consumer Reports, right? Isn't there a movie like that? 11, right? It's not 10, it's 11, because basically it was off the charts. Um, and that's what electric vehicles are. But of course, who can afford an electric vehicle? Not me. Uh, I actually don't own a car. I actually, for 10 years, I have not owned a car. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Now, I did it for selfish economic reasons. Yeah? I mean, owning a car, I'll come back to, to, to why that, that is. Um, uh, not really, but, um, but it, I did the numbers, and it, it, it makes no sense to own a car. So is the EV disruptive? Um, so let me walk you through a couple of things, four things, and, and I have like nine. Um, one is that the internal combustion engine automobile is 17 to 21% efficient. So essentially, 80% of the gasoline in the tank or diesel goes up in smoke, literally, or heat. 80% waste. Um, and the, the electric vehicle is about 95% efficient. So 95% or so of the energy in the battery is actually turned into usable energy. That's five times. Now, that has been the case for a long time. The disruption hasn't happened, but this is disruptive when you combine it with the fact that electrons are cheaper to transmit, to distribute, than atoms, right? So electricity is cheaper than uh, gasoline or diesel. When you combine those two things, what you find is that to charge on a per mile basis, an EV is about 10 times cheaper than um, uh, basically ICE cars, than internal combustion engine automobiles. 10X, every time you see a 10X in a cost basis, uh, you can see a disruption. So this is your car, I mean, you don't have a, uh, an electric vehicle. The internal combustion engine automobile has 2,000 plus moving parts, 2,000. The, 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 the ICE vehicle, the EV has 20. Okay, let me repeat that. 2,020. That's 100 times fewer parts than the internal combustion engine automobile, 100 times. Which means anyone who owns an EV knows it, maintenance is essentially you know, let's say 10x cheaper, right? Not to say free, uh, because a lot of EV companies are offering free maintenance. Why? Because they can. Because, uh, you know, basically, when you look at folks, and I've talked to a lot of them who have used their EVs for hundreds of thousands of miles, they tell me that their biggest cost is basically tires. That's their biggest maintenance cost, tires. Um, so, Try that with your um, ICE vehicle. And the other thing that's disruptive that doesn't get talked about a lot is that the electric vehicle can go about 500,000 miles. Now, on average, we drive about 10,000 miles a year. 10,000. 500,000. We would need 50 years, you know, to take advantage of this. And who uses the same car for 50 years? Not Unless you're in Cuba or something, you're not going to happen, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, th th this is something about EVs that um, is underplayed. And in fact, uh, Tesla and others are building a million mile EV. Now, one million miles. A hundred miles driving the same car. Does that make sense? Well, I'll come back to that and, and why that makes sense. But if we still had the um, individually owned model that we have today where we all own our cars. Um, essentially, and it was a one-to-one -one disruption. Essentially, we would, uh, we would, EVs would compete with ICE vehicles. This is the cost curve. You know, in 2014, I drew this cost curve based on uh, what I knew about lithium ion batteries and so on. And what it says, essentially, is that by 2017 or 18, uh, the market uh, would essentially 
launch several electric vehicles with 200 mile range, at least, because that's what I thought was minimum you need to, to, to go to the mainstream consumer, uh, for $35,000 to $40,000 unsubsidized. And that's what I predicted. And even three years ago, what did folks tell me about that prediction? You're insane, right? Not gonna happen. Guess what did happen? So let me, let me tell you what did happen, but what this says is essentially that even the low end, so the average American car is $33,000 to buy the sticker price, 33. So if you're going to compare 33,000 EV against 33,000 ICE, it's a no brainer, right? Because 90% less maintenance, 90% less energy and so on and so forth, more powerful. And so it basically it makes total economic sense for you to buy an electric vehicle. And the cost curve is even going further down. And you're gonna have by 2022, 200 mile EVs, $20,000. $20,000, 200 mile EVs, unsubsidized. So essentially what this says is that by 2025 or so, I mean, even if I'm wrong by a couple of years, by 2025, every thing that moves, road transportation, buses and tractors and uh, you know, trucks and cars, every vehicle is gonna be electric. Boom, over, right? Every new vehicle. Now, some folks may keep their cars for a few years, but when they go to buy a new one, it's gonna make no economic sense to buy a, a combustion engine. But this is not what's gonna happen. I'll tell you what's gonna happen in a few. So what has happened is exactly what I predicted, which is 35 to $40,000 EVs um, that go to 100 miles by 2017, 2018. So GM just uh, has their bolt. Uh, Tesla Model 3 announced $35,000 or so. Who, who, who basically here has given $1,000 to Tesla? Oh my goodness, there you go. There you go, you, ah, you and 400,000 other people. Sorry, I just wanted, I just wanted to make sure you were awake. Uh, uh, I just flew in from Sydney. I wanted to make sure I was awake, actually. Um, so if they actually sell, and the first day they had 180,000 people give $1,000 each. And this gives you an idea of the latent demand in the market. Um, and, and they raised $400 million. This is the biggest crowdfunding event in history. They did not need an investment bank to raise $400 million. Talk about another disruption. We can talk about that another time. Um, the, the biggest disruption though, and the biggest enabler, is gonna come from autonomous vehicles. Um, today, if you want, you can take a self-driving uh, taxi in Singapore. Today, this is not in the future. I mean, the, 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 the deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence has improved just over the last five years more than it did all the previous 30 years. I mean, that's what I studied at MIT, uh, computer science and focused on AI. And it, the, the, the progress over the last few years has been insane. And Uber uh, also has announced that they're uh, doing self-driving rides in Pittsburgh. So basically this is happening today and a whole host of companies are doing it today. 33 companies are investing uh, billions of dollars and look at the names. This is not just startup companies in Silicon Valley, it's gone mainstream. And I'll tell you why in a moment, but they're investing heavily. Uh, Ford's new CEO came from its self-driving division. And the first hire that, that, that he made came from Uber's self-driving division. So, you know, coincidence, mm, right? Um, now Tesla, back to Tesla, uh, they say, uh, Elon Musk, that by the end of this year, every Tesla uh, will be able to go from a parking lot in San Francisco to a parking lot in New York with no human control. This year, we're talking about 2017, even if he's off by a bit, I mean, these things are happening right now. Now, that's only level three. That's not level five or four, which is what you need to go fully 
autonomous, essentially computer on wheels. You know, essentially the 20 moving parts, four wheels, it's a computer built. Um, and Tesla says that they're gonna have level five autonomy, no pedals, no steering wheel by 2019. 2019, now, you know, this is not, again, in the future, far future. Now, I'm assuming 2021 just for, for the next argument, but you know, Tesla may well get there in 2019 and others may well get there before. Um, so this is happening very quickly. So what about the cost? So if you, if, you, if you read the media, if you read the mainstream analysts, they will tell you that, oh, autonomous vehicles are kind of expensive. And I'll show you two of the key technologies that essentially make uh, an autonomous vehicle possible. So this is what a self-driving car sees when it uses a technology called, a sensor called LIDAR. And LIDAR is laser and radar. So it emits basically laser pulses, about oh, a million laser pulses uh, per second that bounce back uh, basically three to 600 feet, 360 degrees. And they bounce back and essentially th with that, you have a supercomputer in the trunk and it creates a view of the world basically around it in real time. So this is what an autonomous vehicle sees. Um, what is the cost of LiDAR sensors? In 2012, Google said $70,000. And of course, mainstream analysts said what? Not gonna happen, right? Not until 2050 or something, right? Uh, what did happen, in fact, was that the following year, it was $10,000. And the year after that, uh, Silicon Valley company announced a $1,000 LiDAR. So from 70K to 1K within a few years. Um, and, but wait, there's more. That same company announced last year the $250 LiDAR. And that is solid state, which means it, you know, it doesn't move like the current LiDAR, um, it, it, you can focus it, so it's much uh, superior technology at $250. Even if you use four of these, right, you're still talking about $1,000. Now, what about supercomputing power, which, oh yeah, and the $90 LiDAR is coming. The size of a postage stamp, you can use it with your iPhone. I don't know what you're gonna do with it, but you can. <laughs> I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll soon be able to, I'm serious. I mean, so what about supercomputing power, which is what we need to um, basically for these uh, vehicles, computers on wheels to actually happen. So I'll show you the cost curve for supercomputing power. This was the world's first one teraflops computer. Doesn't matter what a teraflops is, it's you know, a geeky thing, but yeah. Um, so trillion floating point operations per second, if you wanna know. So this cost about $50 million in the year 2000. And it was used at Sandia National Labs to do nuclear simulations and so on. So 50 million, year 2000. Last year, a two teraflops computer. This, uh, so did, did I say it was the size of this room? Yeah, so it was the size of this room. Um, now you can hold two teraflops in your hand for 50 bucks. Two teraflops. So, so that's how quickly it's going, or it has gone. And this same company, NVIDIA, uh, announced that by the end of this year, they're gonna have the 20 teraflops computer, GPU, that you need to run a self-driving car. That's what they say you need. 20 teraflops, it's coming at the end of this year. And on top of that, it, it, it basically has an operating system for artificial intelligence that you're gonna need for these cars. So essentially, almost any entrepreneur um, can build a self-driving car. Um, and NVIDIA also says that they expect about a thousand X improvement by 2025. So over the next eight years, a thousand times, whatever it is that, you know, self-driving or other AI, um, uh, functionality is gonna improve by about a thousand times, and that's just the hardware. The real improvement in artificial intelligence has been in the software, and you know, a thousand times over the next eight years. Um, 
And things are going to accelerate this. So disruptions have what I call disruption accelerators. And open source is one of them. Um, so an entrepreneur in San Francisco, actually, with parts, built his own self-driving car with $50,000. Uh, that he spent on Alibaba and Amazon and eBay, spare parts, $50,000, built his own, one person, one engineer, in a garage, literally, in San Francisco. Uh, and he said, oh, you know, what I want to do is sell $1,000 kits to retrofit cars and make them self-driving. Um, and then, essentially, he decided, nah, I'll just open source it. So now, anybody, anywhere, anywhere, India, China, Germany, anywhere, Kenya, can download software for free to do essentially self-driving cars. Boom, right? And then a few hundred dollars for the GPU, a few hundred dollars for the LiDAR, you're in business. You're in business. I mean, essentially a $2,000 investment could make your car uh, autonomous. Now, okay, so why is that disruptive? Yeah, we'll be able to not drive and you know do Twitter or you know whatever it is Facebook or Instagram or anything not not well not driving because there's not going to be a steering wheel but is that really disruptive you know let me tell you about my latest work um, essentially that came out about four weeks ago it's called uh, disruption of so basically I double clicked on clean disruption uh, I started a think tank about a year ago focused on disruptions then our first uh, uh, essentially report is the disruption of transportation and we call it transport as a service and this is what's going to happen um, we use our cars we pay we meaning the average American family about ten thousand dollars a year uh, to own a car ten thousand dollars a year and yet we only use it four percent of the time four percent of the time and ninety six percent of the time it's parked and in fact parking space is usually more expensive than your car, okay? That's subsidized by society. But of course, you know, we don't know this. Um, but 4% asset utilization is a disruption waiting to happen. So what's the disruption? The convergence of three things. Electric vehicles. Remember that $500,000 EV? Well, as individual owners, we can't really take advantage of that. So electric vehicles, self-driving, um, and ride-hailing. So imagine Uber or Lyft without a driver uh, and electric. So when that happens, essentially, vehicle asset utilization goes from 4% of the time to, say, 40% of the time. That's a 10x improvement. So cars are going to be running around, picking you up at home, taking you to work, picking somebody else up and taking them to the supermarket and so on. And instead of 10,000 miles per year, they're going to be driving 100,000 miles per year. And that's where essentially an EV, which can last 500,000 and soon will last a million right, miles, uh, shines. Because you know, they can last five years, the same vehicle, whereas the internal combustion engine automobile usually lasts 140,000 miles. Even if you push it, you push it to 200,000. So even at 200,000, that is less than a year and a half if you run it like an Uber, autonomous, right? It can compete against the 500,000 miles EV. Does that make sense? So when you compare autonomous, electric, and on demand with autonomous, ICE, on demand, essentially the ICE can't compete. Combustion engine cannot compete. Um, so we did the numbers comparing all you know, permutations of uh, on-demand versus individual ownership and ICE versus EV and so on and so forth. And you know, essentially, if a company competes, you know, they say, oh, I'm going to be the Uber you know, of, of, and I'm going to use the same internal combustion engine automobile, um, they can't compete because this is the cost of a EV, autonomous electric uh, vehicle, and this is the cost of a ICE. So they either go bankrupt or they're going to have to move their fleet to electric. So in the end, it's all going to be electric because of that. Why? For purely economic reasons. So let's assume that 2021 is when we have autonomous vehicles, the technology, and they're approved by the regulators 
to essentially go on open, open roads. Um, not all, they could be geofenced over the, you know, the first couple of years. Um, essentially, the day that autonomous, electric, autonomous vehicles are approved, the cost of transportation on a per mile basis is going to be 10 times cheaper with transport as a service by AVs than it is to own a car, a combustion engine car, 10 times. Now, every time, did I say that this is my work, disruption? Okay, so I have looked at disruptions all the way back to O. Gutenberg, the printing press. When the first book, the first Bible, came out of Gutenberg's printing press, it was 10 times cheaper than a manuscript Bible. 10x, every time that there has been a 10x improvement in cost on a same product or service basis, there has been a disruption. Every single time. I know of no other case, of no case where a 10x did not lead to a disruption. So on day one in 2021, that's gonna happen. What are we gonna do when, if we own a car already, then you know, we may drive it for a little bit, but if you're going to buy a new car, 2021, essentially here's what you're gonna uh, decide. Do I wanna spend 10 grand a year over the next five years? Or do I wanna spend oh, $1,000 a year over the next five years? No brainer, right? I mean, essentially you're not gonna buy a new car, period. And even if you are driving the exi your existing car, even if you're driving a car that essentially your uncle gave you, free, free, right, that you already paid off. Um, that's gonna be up to four times more expensive on a per mile basis than AEV, four times. So you're gonna be like, wait a second, I paid off my car and yet the cost of gasoline and insurance and maintenance and so on is four times more expensive than taking this transport as a service. And by the way, I don't have to drive. So as people give up their cars, essentially what's gonna happen is that cars, the used car industry is gonna collapse because nobody's gonna buy new cars. It doesn't make sense to buy new cars. And in fact, I, I think that there's gonna be a negative value of used cars. Negative, not just zero resale value, but negative. I mean, you have, you're gonna have to pay people to take a car off your hands. But, but look at the, the, the car companies. They're gonna have to compete with two things, used cars at zero and AEV, which is 10 times cheaper. What do you think is gonna happen? Who's gonna buy a new car? So that's the collapse of the auto industry, of the internal combustion engine automobile. Um, boom, it's over. And it's also the demise of the individual ownership of cars. Now, every technology, like I said, successful, and certainly a 10x difference in cost would be one, uh, grows in S-curves, right? Gets adopted as S-curves. So essentially what we modeled was that assuming 2021 is the year when autonomous vehicles are approved, it may be a year or two after, but whatever it is, it's gonna be a 10 year disruption. So assuming it's 2021, by 2030, essentially 95% of all passenger miles are gonna be autonomous electric vehicles. By 2030, 95%, boom. Right, there goes the internal combustion engine industry. There goes uh, you know, the individual model of ownership of cars. So we're gonna have cars as a service, just like we have movies as a service, and music as a service, and software as a service, and so on. Um, so it, it's the end, pretty much, of internal combustion engine and individual ownership of cars. Um, so if you have cars that are going around 10, basically 40% of the time, you're gonna need fewer cars. So what we modeled was, essentially what came out of our uh, um, simulations, we need a fleet that's 80% smaller of cars. We're gonna have 80% fewer cars on the road. Yeah, that's because they're gonna go around, yeah. Um, so, you know, what happens to parking space? Gone. What happens to insurance, car insurance? Gone, 
right? And a whole host of other things get disrupted. I did the numbers for Los Angeles, and the, the, the parking space that's gonna open up in LA, you can fit three cities the size of San Francisco. <laughs> three cities, right? So, I mean, the, 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 do they, does LA want to create the wealth of three San Francisco's? Or do they want a desert in the middle of uh, Los Angeles? So basically, these are the decisions that, that, you know, the, 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 that they're gonna have to start making. And we're all gonna have to start making because we're gonna have a lot of empty parking space. Um, demand, like I said, is gonna collapse for new vehicles because we're gonna need fewer uh, new vehicles. And so because the AV lasts longer, essentially manufacturing new demand for new vehicles is gonna go down by 70%. So we need 80% fewer cars that last longer, so we need 70% fewer cars. So uh, essentially, what does that mean for oil? Here's what that means. This is all about the economics. I mean, this is, this is all about the economics. Oil demand is gonna peak 2020. Um, and essentially, it's gonna go down at, at about 100 million barrels per day, and it's gonna go down to about 70 million barrels by 2030. By 2030, so it's gonna go down 30%. Um, so a lot of the investments that are being made now in oil, gone, right? Which ones? Well, the expensive oil, because in oil, in the business, all you need, because it's so inelastic on both the demand and the supply side, uh, essentially a two million barrel oversupply in the market, as we learned in 2014, can make the market crash, the prices crash. And that's gonna happen as soon as 2021, assuming that autonomous vehicles are approved 2021. Um, so, and the equilibrium price is gonna be $25. So any oil that's produced that, that can compete at 25, essentially is unviable unviable and it's gonna be stranded. Any oil that can compete at 25 is gonna be stranded, boom, right? Now, if you look at what oil is produced, cannot compete, essentially, uh, deep water, gone. Uh, shale oil, gone. Sands, gone. Because they can't compete at 25, period. So essentially, conventional oil is gonna be the only oil that may survive in those markets um, because it can't compete at 25. So the whole geopolitics of oil uh, is gonna change and uh, you know, depending on where you are in this market, but essentially the disruption of prices is gonna happen as soon as 2021 or two. And so all the assets, by the way, what this means is all the assets, refineries, uh, pipelines, and so on associated with the expensive oil are also gonna be stranded. Now, what would those be? Oh, it's higher? Gasoline stations gone. But what about pipelines? What pipelines are gonna be stranded? Anyone? Anyone? So any pipelines that, that basically, um, should I name names? Uh, out, of, out of Canada to uh, uh, basically gone, right? Because that oil is gonna be gone. So it's gonna be stranded. Uh, anything out of Bakken, essentially, is gonna be stranded. Uh, oil pipelines. And that's gonna happen over the next five years, not 20. So if you're investing on a 10-year basis, well, you know, check that out. Um, okay, so the last disruption that I'm going to talk about is solar. So solar is a technology just like everything that I'm talking about. I mean, these are technologies. And, you know, I spend quite a bit of time in Denmark these days, for whatever reason. Um, but solar, this is a school in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Now, Copenhagen is three degrees south of Juneau. Juneau, Alaska, right? And this school generates 50% of its energy, annual energy demand, with solar in Denmark. So, you know, the excuses that, well, we don't get enough sunshine or whatnot, don't actually, you know, basically, there's so much proof that, uh, you know, in the summer, what do you do in the summer? 
right? Uh, 50%. Do you see the solar here? Where is the solar? Huh? It's the walls. It's the walls, essentially. It's integrated. It's the walls. That's the solar. The whole building is one solar power plant. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Alaska. Solar works. Uh, and it's very cheap. Since the year 1970, uh, in 1970, it was $100 per watt. And now it's 30 cents. That's a 300 time improvement. Since I, I mean, it's gone down by about 11.5% every year since 1970. And every year, essentially, uh, you know, the propaganda is so it can't possibly go down further. Guess what happens? It keeps going down further without breakthroughs. This is just the cost curve of solar. Um, and despite all the, you know, who had all the negative press and all that, solar, the installed base, has doubled every two years since the year 2000. This is on a global basis. That is uh, basically a growth compounded of 40% per year. Doubled every two years since the year 2000. Now, solar is about all one and a half percent of generation. So remember that little internal combustion engine automobile in the middle of that street in New York? It's about 1%, one percent, one and a half percent. Now, if it keeps doubling, and it's doubling every two years, how long, how many years until solar is 100% of the world's uh, generation of energy? Let's do the numbers. So one and a half percent, let's double it every two, two years. 3%, one doubling, 6, 12%, 24, 48, 96. Six doublings. Say I'm wrong by a couple of years, seven doublings, that is 14 years. So essentially by 2030 or so, solar, if it keeps growing like this, and remember S-curves, right, exponential, it's going to be 100% of the world's energy generation. Whoa, right? Can it really do it? I mean, you can do anything on a spreadsheet, but let's, let, you know, let, let's see the economics, right? Uh, let's do the, the, the trends in conventional energy versus solar. All of conventional energy, nukes and gas and coal and so on, have gone up by about 6 to 16 times since the year 1970. 6 to 16 times up, while solar has gone down by 300 times, right? So when you put that together, since 1970, solar has improved by about 5,000 times uh, versus petroleum and natural gas, uh, by about 1,800 times versus coal. And again, did I say solar PV is a technology? It's going to keep going down. Um, so you know, we've talked about this thing called <laughs> grid parity, right? Um, and grid parity is the point at which solar on the rooftop is as cheap or the same rate or even cheaper than uh, what we pay the, uh, the utility. And, you know, it's important, according to Deutsche Bank, by the end of this year, 2017, solar will, will be at or below grid parity in 80% of global markets. That is not bad for an industry in crisis, right? 80% of world markets, solar, will be at or below utility rates. So it's just a matter of economics. It's going to happen, right? And what a lot of folks are not talking about is that um, companies are going solar because it makes economic sense. So according to PwC, 69% of corporations are actively pursuing solar because it's cheap, right? 16, it doesn't mean that they're going to buy it now, but at least it's in the consideration set. And companies like Apple are going 100%, and Facebook, and you know, Amazon, and Ikea, and so on. Why? Because it makes economic sense. Because when you're Apple, and you have data centers, your biggest cost in a data center is what? Energy. And can anyone say that they're going to give you the same rate, the same rate for 25 years? No brainer, right, for Apple to go 100% solar. It makes total economic sense. Um, and even, you know, this is Mandalay Bay Casino, which essentially put up solar on all its rooftop. That generates 25% of its energy. And they want to get off the grid. I mean, they want to basically buy in the open market. 
because they're like, you know, we can buy solar today, which is cheaper than, um, you know, we're, what we're paying the utility. And so because of this, because we are at grid parity in so many markets, uh, the S-curve may actually accelerate. It may go way beyond the, the 40%. Um, so I invented a new term, right? I call it God parity, not grid parity. Now, what is that? Uh, essentially, when the cost of solar on your rooftop, unsubsidized, falls below the cost of transmission. So think about that. Cost of transmission, which is anywhere from seven to 12 cents, um, anything that is centrally generated, right? Coal, nukes, you name it, whatever. Um, anything, even if they can generate at zero, which is not possible, but if they go to CERN to Switzerland and they bring that God particle and they're able to generate at zero, when you add that seven to 12 cents of transmission, you're still not gonna be able to compete with self-generation. Does that make sense? That's what I call God parity. At that point, and this is just solar generation, solar plus storage, and so by 2020, in places like Colorado, you'll be able to generate unsubsidized solar at four cents. Four cents on the rooftop. Central generation, boom, gone. It's gonna be obsolete because there's gonna be so much generation in homes and businesses, uh, at the malls and parking lots and so on and so forth, right? Because it's gonna make economic sense. Because when the sun shines, and I think it shines here about 2,000 hours per year, essentially there is no cheaper form of energy generation than solar on your rooftop. Okay, so essentially utility scale, gone, right? Uh, anything central generation essentially can't compete with self-generation. And even when you add the cost of storage, which is going down by about 20%, by about 2020, you should be able to buy solar plus storage oh, at about seven cents, seven cents. So solar plus storage is gonna be still less than the cost of transmission. At that point, Everyone, everywhere, it's gonna make selfish, you know, when you make the selfish economic decision, it's gonna to be to go solar. And that's gonna happen by 2020. This is only three years away. And that's when the, basically the curve, the S curve really accelerates because it's gonna be in everyone's selfish economic interest to go solar. Uh, so every house and business and warehouse and, and, and factory and, and so on is going to have solar because it's going to be in their best selfish economic interest. Now, what's going to happen in cities that can't generate 100% of, I'm not saying that folks are going to get off the grid. Most of us cannot generate all we need, but essentially uh, it's going to be a distributed, like the internet, it's going to be an internet of energy, an internet of solar, an internet of batteries. Um, what happens with data centers and aluminum smelters and so on? Well, we still need utility scale. And what is happening in, in large scale generation is that essentially we're falling under four cents per kilowatt hour in solar. Um, you know, and just to give you an idea, solar at about 5.8 cents uh, is equivalent to gas at five and it's equivalent to oil at 10. Good luck competing with solar. Right? And that's at 4.8 cents. Now, we're below, way below that already. In fact, um, in Dubai, they announced that 3 cents solar, 2.99 cents. That's half of 5.8, right? And in, Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, they announced a 2.4 cent per kilowatt hour. 2.4, right? I mean, I, I, I spoke with the CEO of a utility who had just signed a 3 cent deal, and he asked me, do you think I paid too much? <laughs> so now, no, 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 hear me out. In 2009, I published a book called Solar Trillions where I said that solar was gonna be below 3.5 cents by 2020. And what did people tell me? Yeah, what are you smoking, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and that was in 2009. And guess what? We blew past that. Okay, and that sounded insane in 2009 when solar was at 30 cents, but all you needed to do was do the cost curve of both solar and capital costs, right? So 
at three cents, there is nothing, nothing that can compete with utility scale solar at this cost. Not gas, not coal, nothing can compete with solar at three, oh, with three cents, period, end of story. Um, so essentially anything, any new investments uh, have to go solar because any other investments are gonna be stranded. Any nuclear, any coal, any natural gas is gonna be stranded in a place where you have sunshine the way you have here, you know, at least in, in the desert. Um, and not only that, um, solar, some folks are saying, oh, but what about storage? I mean, you can only generate during the day. What about in the evening? Well, guess what? Uh, Tucson Electric just announced solar plus storage at four and a half cents. Four and a half cents, gone. Everything else, gone. So solar, distributed solar, because of the economics, is gonna eat everything. Because it's gonna make economic sense. And that's gonna happen in most places by about 2020. It's already happened in places like Australia. Australia, solar residential is 25%. 25% of homes in Australia have solar. I mean, the equivalent here would be 20 million houses, right? Now, in Australia, transmission is 12 cents. Solar is 7 cents. So the concept of God parity, which again sounded crazy three years ago, is already here. I mean, it's already happening in, in, in some markets around the world. Um, and of course, peakers are already obsolete. You know, peakers generate at 20 cents, 40 cents, 70 cents. And when solar plus storage is four and a half cents, uh, you know, this is pure economics, right? It doesn't make sense to build peakers anymore. So let me, uh, let me wrap it up and let me go back to the future. It's 2017 and we're here. A lot of the technologies that I'm telling you about are still in the one to 2% or so market uh, globally. In some countries like Germany, it's 50% or 30%. In Australia, residential, it's 25%. But globally, it's about 1%, 1.5%, which leads mainstream analysts say, not gonna happen anytime soon, but the economics are already here. I mean, the, 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 the unsubsidized solar, the economics are already here. Um, and this is not an energy transition. This is a technology disruption. And it's gonna happen very, very, very quickly. And the tipping point is gonna be about 2020 or so for both energy and transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.